this morning we'll be dealing with the words of Paul, Galatians chapter 4, the verses five, 4 and 5. And 4 and 5, you can almost say, is, summarizes the passage that we read in together. And so it's a good window in which we can look at the entire passage. The passage itself that we read is, is somewhat technical in different places, and so we're going to try to not become too technical in our sermon this morning. And so these, these verses really summarize what Paul is, is really trying to get at here in this section. So let us read together those, those words from Galatians 4, chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, where Paul writes, he says, But when the time had fully come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. So far, our text for this morning. Brothers and sisters of our Lord in Jesus Christ, earlier in this chapter, in verses 15 through 22, which we dealt with last Sunday, Paul told us about the purpose for God's law, why God gave us his law. You see, there are these false teachers there in the church, churches of Galatia who told the believers it isn't enough uh, to believe in Jesus to be saved. You also need to keep the law if you want to be saved. And then Paul's response was, well, remember Abraham. Remember how Abraham was saved not by, not by the law, but he was saved through the promise of, that God gave to Abraham that he would save him. And, and then God didn't some 430 years later under Moses uh, decide he's going to add an additional condition to our salvation when he gave Israel the law. Now when God gave Israel the law, his purpose was that he might teach Israel that their only hope rests in the promise that he had given to Abraham, the promise that was also given to the people of Israel for the law condemns us of sin, but God's promise is what offer, is, is a promise which God's, in which God offers to us eternal life. Well, Paul now can, continues his argument in, verse, in chapter 3, verse 23 and following, which we read together. As I said, there are some technical arguments that he, that he makes. Basically, he says that in the Old Testament... The law of God acted as a guardian over the people of Israel until Christ should come. And so that when Christ came, that through Christ we may be justified by faith. Now Paul's point is, is not that Israel was saved somehow through the law. But the law was the means by which the Lord God was directing the attention of the people of Israel to look forward to the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham, that promise of the coming Christ. Paul then in this section compares Israel to an heir. You know, when, when an heir who, is, who, when his father dies, will receive the whole inheritance, when an heir is under age, then the promise of the inheritance is already his. Already, already has that promise. But he doesn't receive that inheritance until he comes of age. And so Paul basically is saying, he says, the people of Israel, they came of age when Christ came. Because that's when the promise finally is fulfilled. Well, in chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, which we will deal with this morning, you can say it's a good summary of what Paul wants to teach us here in this section. Paul says, he says, No, when the time God set had fully come, God then sent his Son to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption into sonship. And so the central point that Paul wants to make here is that we do not make ourselves children of God. We don't decide that we're going to become children of God. We don't take that. No, he says we receive this sonship, and we receive it through the saving work of the Lord Jesus. You don't become children of God by obeying the law. In fact, Paul's been arguing that's impossible because the law convicts us of sin. But you receive that gift of being children of God as a gift that comes through the redeeming, through the saving work of Jesus Christ. 
And so this morning, I will proclaim to you God's word, word under this theme. In Christ, we receive adoption to sonship. So in Christ, we receive adoption to sonship. Under that theme, we'll look at different parts of the text. Uh, when, first of all, we'll look at when the time had fully come, what that means. Secondly, Christ redeems those who are under the law. Thirdly, that we receive, a, that we, we receive adoption as children of God. In the fourth place, we'll look at our freedom as, as family of God and as children of God. One of the most important lessons that we can learn from this verse is that the Lord God in heaven always works in his time, in his own time. It's clear when Paul writes that when the time had fully come, is that God himself is not bound by time. We know that God himself is eternal, in whom there is no beginning and there is no end. God is not bound by time as, as we are. But when God created the world, God then created time, and having created time, God also works out his plan for his creation in time. And so often God's people wonder, oh, why does the Lord take so, so long to come to my rescue? Why does the Lord not end all the suffering in my life, in the life of my loved ones, or in the life of this world today? But the reality, beloved, is if God acted like that, if God then decided to take away all the suffering, all the troubles of this world to today, all his works and all his plans would immediately come to a screeching halt. It would come to an end. But God is working towards a goal. And that goal is our salvation. It's the salvation of all his, his people. And that goal will be accomplished not in our time, not when we want it, not when we say to God, God, now it's about time, but it will be accomplished in the time that is set by God. And so we're taught here that we need to learn patience as we wait for the Lord to come and to fulfill his purpose for us, right? That's what it means to live by faith. Living by faith means that we patiently wait for God to fulfill what he promised us and what he said he would do for us. And so Paul says, when the time had fully come, what does God do? God sent his son. Remember earlier, Paul is writing about God's promise to Abraham. And when he says the time has fully come, what he means is the time when, when, when God fulfilled would fulfill his promise to Abraham when that time has, has come. He went and he sent the seed. He sent the Lord Jesus. Remember in chapter 3, 16, Paul writes about the promise of a seed. And then remember that, that, he's, that Paul then says, remember that God spoke there about seed in singular. In other words, God was already promising to Abraham uh, that he would give him uh, the Christ, Jesus Christ. And so it's been happening through all these years after Abraham is at God's people and also the people of Israel. They're waiting for that time when this seed, who is Jesus, will come to this world. And during that long period of time between Abraham and the coming of the Lord Jesus, Israel waited for the promise to come. And Paul says, what God did is God then gave his law during that time to the people of Israel to keep Israel uh, as, as a guardian, to keep Israel for the day that was to come. Well, the day the Lord Jesus came to this world, beloved, that's the moment. That's the moment that everything changed here on this earth. What was promised by God long ago now becomes a reality in this world. It becomes a reality for our life. The example that Paul uses in, in this chapter is, is that of an heir. Right in the Old Testament, God's people were heirs to the promise. Yet in a sense, they were like an underage son. They had the promise. The promise was theirs, but they had not yet come into their inheritance. The promise has not yet been fulfilled. But when Christ came, the age of maturity also came in which God's people came into their inheritance. When Christ came, we now receive life in Jesus Christ. And so we need to keep in mind is that in the Old Testament, the people were living by the promise. But the promise did not become a reality until the promised seed, who is Jesus Christ, came into the world. 
And now that the Lord Jesus has come, the promise of God has been fulfilled. And now the people of Israel, now they could live each day free in the knowledge that they have been redeemed, that they have been saved by the blood of Christ. And so what we need to understand here is, is this, is that what we have today, which Israel did not yet have before Christ, is that we now, beloved, we have received the promise in Jesus Christ. It means that we are now able to live in the freedom of our Lord. We're not waiting for that freedom anymore to come as God had promised Israel. No, we are living today in the very freedom of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it is in that freedom we have in Christ that we can look forward with full assurance that we're going to enter into the glorious kingdom of our God. Because the kingdom is already here, Jesus says. So Israel, they lived under the promise. But now that the time has been fully set, has come, we now live in the promise. For Christ has delivered us from the curse of the law. Well, Paul continues on and he says, Well, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. God sent his son, born of a woman. Here are important words. This reveals that the promise that God gave already long ago, and here we can go back all the way to the beginning, to the promise that God gave to Eve, the mother of all living. Remember God gave Eve that promise that she, after the fall into sin that she would receive a seed, a son, a one who would come and who would destroy the seed of the serpent who is the devil. And so the Son of God came from heaven and he has now become one with humanity, being born of a woman as God had promised long ago. And being born of a woman, who has, the result is he's also born under the law. That means that just as the people of Israel before Jesus, so Jesus too is born under the law as the people of Israel were born under the law. And as the law condemned everybody in Israel, so Jesus Christ was also going to be condemned under that same law when he was nailed to the cross of Golgotha. Right? When Jesus came to this world, the, re the reality is that the freedom had not yet, from sin had not yet become a reality. It was simply a, still a promise. That means that all mankind, including all the Jews, were condemned by the law. But even Jesus Christ himself would also now be condemned under that very same law, even though we know that he was perfect and he was without sin. So you see, the Lord Jesus Christ is the one that God promised. He would send to this world, and when he comes, that would change everything in the world. God sent his son to redeem those, Paul says, who were under the law. What's important here is that little word redeem. The word redeem is very closely connected to, to also to the freeing of, of, of slaves in those days. Right? If, if you were a, a slave and you were a slave to a master, uh, in order that you might become free, somebody would need to come and would need to pay the master the money uh, that was owed to, to the master, that the slave owed to the master. Or simply the, the, the price that would be needed in order to give him freedom. And when that money was paid to the master, uh, the result is that the slave was set free. And when he was set free, then he would be just like all the other free people in society. When a person was set free, uh, they would not be treated as a slave anymore. They would no longer be treated as being inferior to others. No, they would now have the same status as everyone else who is free in society. He is now a free man. That means he has the freedom to act and to live as he desires. He has the same rights as everyone else who is free. Well, Paul says, we were slaves to the law. Why? Because the law constantly condemned us to sin and it condemned us to corruption, condemned us to eternal uh, hell. And so he says, in, he says in, verse, in chapter 4, verse 3, he says that we were in slavery under the elemental forces of the world. 
Chapter 4, verse 8, he explains that we were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. And so Paul here is, is referring to the spiritual forces of sin and darkness. And so what does the law do? Well, the law uh, con uh, convicts all men, Jews and Gentiles alike, of being slaves to sin, being slaves to the forces of darkness and evil. So the law then convicts us all of being slaves. And for that reason, Paul argues that the law cannot save us. Beloved, the law constantly condemns us there in the sight of our God. And what's the promise of God? The promise of God is that He will send His Son. And when His Son comes, what He will do is He will redeem us from the very slavery, our very slavery to sin. And so Christ comes and He pays the price for us. And when He was condemned under the law, worthy to be nailed to the cross. To redeem then means that Jesus has given the ultimate sacrifice for us on the cross. It means, beloved, that you are no longer slaves to the law. You're no longer slaves to the elemental forces of wickedness and evil. Christ makes you and I, makes us free people, which means that in the eyes of God, we again, we have value, we have worth. You see, my worth, my value does not depend, as we were constantly are told also in our culture today, you know what, you're worth it because you're such a good person. We need to just think ourselves to be worthy people who are worthy of whatever we want to aspire to. That's not where you find our worth. In fact, you'll find when you, when you, do, when you do that that you'll be disappointed all the time. My worth, my value does not depend on what I have done because the reality is that I can do nothing. The law says, or the law shows me that I'm a slave. So I'm a slave to the law of sin. When the Lord Jesus Christ comes and he was nailed to the cross, condemned under the law, comes and he sets me free. My value, beloved, does not rest in what I can do. Doesn't rest in what kind of person I am. But my value rests in the fact that I am now a child of God, a child of God who has been made free by the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's conveyed so beautifully in those last words of, of verse 5, where Paul writes that we might receive adoption to sonship. See, the Father sent His Son, Jesus, to redeem us so that we might be adopted by the Father to be his children. We know that the Lord Jesus is the, the true natural son of God. He is God. What Paul is saying is, but we, we are, uh, are adopted by the Father uh, as his children. And so we become children of God uh, through the promise, promise that he would make us his children, not because of anything that we have done or that we have earned. So remember, this is the promise uh, to Abraham, that Abra God says to Abraham, you and all your descendants after you, you will be my children. I will be your God. And that was a promise that could only be received through faith. Notice, received through faith. The word receive here in Paul's, um, in, well, in what Paul writes, is really the key to understanding what Paul is really getting at. Somebody wrote, he says, receive is a freedom word. Take is not. Now, take is not a freedom word. Well, you know, freedom is, is something that you receive, not something that you take, which is totally counter anything that you're being told here in this world and in, in our culture. Think of Adam and Eve. Remember Adam and Eve in the, in the beginning? They, they took the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God says you should not eat. They took the fruit. Why? Because they thought that it would give them freedom from God. Yet what was the result? The result is they lost their freedom. And in our culture to today, people think that freedom is something that, that you must grab, that you must take hold of. Right? It's like 
You have to take hold of that great life for that good life that you want to live. And if you don't take hold of it, well, then I guess you're just going to flounder in this life. So take hold of it and, and take your freedom because you're worthy of it. Perhaps the area where one of the, the issues today that, that you see this kind of argumentation and this reasoning is the whole abortion rights issue that has sort of exploded because of a decision of the Supreme Court in the United States a few weeks ago. Many will argue that if a mother is pregnant with a child, that mother has the right. That is, they have the freedom to make choices about their own bodies. Right? It's like, like Eve taking the fruit in the garden. And they think that they can take that freedom. But what they don't understand is the, the serious consequences of their decision. You might think that you're free, but you don't understand in, indeed the results of, of, of what you're doing. And so freedom, freedom is what everybody talks about today. And so you should make sure people say that is that you take the freedom for yourself because when you take the freedom for yourself, you'll make a better life for yourself. So you need to be assertive and you need to take what you want from this life. Well, the reality, beloved, is, and this is what we find time and again, is that it leads to slavery. It leads to a loss of freedom in our life. Paul points, out, points that out through the work of the Lord Jesus, a freedom that is already he says, it's already here. Right? In Christ, the freedom is right here in this, in this world. You don't need to grasp for that freedom. You don't need to go out and take it somehow because you just can't. No, you receive it. You receive it from God as a gift. Yes, we receive adoption as children of God. That means, beloved, it's all God's work. It's not our work. It was God who came to Abraham and, and gave him the promise of the seed. What did Abraham do for that? Nothing. And when God gave him that promise, what did Abraham do? Abraham simply believed God, that God would indeed do what he said. And remember that Abraham in his old age, yeah, he received that promise, but there was nothing, nothing that Abraham could do to, to have a child. Nothing Abraham can do. For he and Sarah, well, they were too old to have children. They couldn't, they, whatever they could do, they could try to get all kinds of medical help, but it wouldn't make any difference. But it was God who came and opened the, war, the, the womb of Sarah in her old age and, and gave to them a child. They didn't take it on themselves, although Abram tried at a certain point, and, and it, it led only to disaster when he had a child with Hagar. No, they receive this gift, this promise from God. And by faith, they trusted that God would give it to them, even though, humanly speaking, you kind of say, how is that possible? And so, beloved, also our adoption into God's family, something that we receive from the Lord our God. There's nothing, uh, we cannot do anything to become God's children. No, the Father, He comes to you, and He comes to you with this promise. And in faith, you believe that the, pro that the Father will indeed do what He's promised to you in Christ in Jesus. And His promise is that for the sake of Christ, I will adopt you as my very own children. Right? The Father gives to me the greatest freedom in the world. And what's that freedom? That freedom, beloved, is to again be children of God. That freedom is that I may again belong to God's family, that I may again inherit the riches of His kingdom. And so we might say, well, why would you say that our greatest freedom is that I may be again a child of God? Right today, many people don't even think about that as being freedom. Today, people say they want to be free from God. Right? That's the greatest freedom. Be free from God. Be free from all religions. That's basically the mantra that we see in here today in our society. But beloved, what Scripture has revealed to us is that freedom can only be experienced in relationship with the Lord your God. See, that's what Adam and Eve, they discovered, but they discovered it too late after they fell into sin. Right? They, they thought in paradise that they could enjoy freedom, freedom without God. God. 
But the reality was that they lost their freedom there in the garden. Right? Without God in their life, they lost everything. Right? They were exiled from the garden, which was the very source of their existence. And outside of the garden, there they suffered misery. And this only suffering awaited them and ultimately death. Remember how Lord Jesus told us the story about the prodigal son. Remember the prodigal son? What did he want? He wanted to enjoy freedom from his father. He says, I want to have freedom. I want to leave my father's house. And, and so he took the money that uh, belonged to him uh, the, from his father and he went out into the world. And he thought, I'm going to enjoy the freedom of living out in the world. And for a while, when he was out there, he thought he was enjoying uh, the best life he had ever lived. Right? He enjoyed uh, his money, and he spread it around, and he, and he enjoyed life to the fullest. The day came when he lost everything. He lost all his money. He lost all his friends. He didn't even have anything to eat. Couldn't even eat the food offered to the pigs. The result is he became desperate. He realized that the, death, that the freedom that the world seemed to be offering him was no freedom at all. And what happened? Remember, he began to think. He thought back to the time that he was in his father's house. And he longed. He longed to go back because now he realized the freedom that he had left behind when he left his father. Because he knew there in his father's house, the father would never abandon him. The father would always be there to care for him. His father would make sure that he was provided with everything in his life. He wouldn't be desperately looking for food because the father would be providing that in his life. Suddenly he realized, you know, there is no better place in this world than there in my father's house. So the freedom for which he grasped out in the world, he wanted to take, was, not, was no freedom. But he learned that freedom could only be found in his father's house. And so he longed to again be in his father's house because there he knew, there it would be so much better. And then he returned home. What happened when he returned home? Well, the father received him. Yes, the father received him with open arms. The father didn't make any demands on him like the older son wanted him to do. The father didn't say, you need to earn your place again here in this family. No, the father welcomes, him, uh, welcomes home his son with open arms. And he says, this my son who was lost is found again. You see what Jesus does, beloved? He restores us again to that intimate relationship with the Father in heaven. Chapter 4, verse 6, Paul writes, he says, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts. The Spirit who crawls out, Abba, Father. The word Abba is an Aramaic word that is used to express endearment for one's father. It expresses an, an intimate closeness, like that of a child who would say, Daddy, Mommy. And some say, well, isn't that a rather irreverent way of speaking to God? Shouldn't we hold God up to something higher? Well, but think of that little child. A little child who addresses Dad as Daddy. Does not, not because they think less of daddy. No, they call him daddy because they love their father. Love their father with their whole being. They feel totally free to come to dad for everything in their life. Dad is the one whom they worship. The one who is so important to them. And so, beloved, it is so important to understand the Lord Jesus does not just save us from being punished for our sins. You understand that this being redeemed from, the, from God's wrath is, is not a financial transaction. No. 
When Christ redeems us, when he saves us from our sins, when he pays for our sins, what does he do? He restores us again to an intimate relationship with our Father in heaven. The freedom that we experience is like that which a little child enjoys with his or her father. As God's adopted children, beloved, we love our Father. We love Him with our whole heart. We cry out to Him in our time of need. Right? When, when things are not going well, where do we go? We go to the Father and say, Father, help me. We entrust ourselves to the Father that He is the one who will protect me. And we look forward with hope because we know that my Father will give to me the glorious inheritance in His kingdom. He will deliver me from the troubles and the suffering and the pain of this life. And He'll give me glorious life everlasting. What a glorious gift we have received in our adoption as children of God. And then finally, the freedom that we experience by being adopted into God's family is also what unites the church as a family or as the people of God. See, within the church, there is a unity now between brothers and sisters. Why? Because we all belong uh, to the one family of God. It means, beloved, that every one of us has been bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Chapter 3, 28, Paul writes these words. He says, Now in Christ Jesus there is neither Jew nor Gentile, there's neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. What Lord Jesus has done is he's broken down the human barriers between different peoples in the world so that those who are, are separated in our culture today are now being united within the church to be the children of God. Right in the world we find divisions between different races. And it's interesting that today, you think about the critical race theory that wants to address the whole issue of racism. How do they address it? They address it by dividing everybody up into different races. And there is that division between races that is being enhanced in, in, in our society's thinking. Right? And there's divisions, not only between different races, divisions between people of different color. But Paul says, but you know, in God's family... There is no distinction, for there is neither Jew nor Gentile. In our culture, there are distinctions between different classes of people. Every culture has developed some kind of a class system. Think of Europe, you think of the nobility, think of the lords, and then there's the merchant class, and, and then there might be uh, the rich, and then the middle class, and then there are the poor. We find that even in our culture here in this country. There are the elites, and then there are the middle class, and then there are those who are the lower, so-called lower class. Other cultures have developed a caste system, caste system that ranks one caste as higher or lower than, than another, and there's no way that you can go from one caste to another because you're simply born into it. Indeed, our birth can determine if we are born into wealth, you may be born into privilege. You might be born into a situation where you have greater educational opportunities. But beloved, in God's family, all those distinctions, they all disappear. And as to sex, Paul says, he says there's no distinction between men and women. All are equal in the eyes of our Heavenly Father. Now, is Paul saying here that there are then no differences between people? There are no differences between men and women? Well, not at all. Also within the church, a, a woman is not treated as a man, and a man is not treated as a woman. You know, today we live in a time where people are trying to do away with all those distinctions, saying people can choose uh, whatever they want to choose, whatever sex they want to be. That's not what Paul is, is saying here. No, within the church we still see that we are coming from different races. We may have different colors. Within the church, there are people who may be better off financially and others who may be struggling financially. Within the church, there are people with different talents. Some have greater talents and abilities than, than, others, who do, than others do. Right, Paul, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, talks about the church of the body of Christ, and we all have different, we all have different gifts, different abilities. 
And so Paul is not somehow saying that these differences within the body of Christ do not exist. But what Paul is saying this, beloved, is that within the body of Christ, those barriers, those, those differences that, the, that are out there in the world, they don't matter anymore. They no longer are barriers to having fellowship with one another. No longer barriers in, in order to love one another and care for one another and be there for one another. Right In a, in a family, parents, they, they love all their children. And parents, as much as they can, humanly speaking, and as much as is humanly possible, they will love each one of their children the same. Good, faithful, loving parents will not show favoritism to one of their children above other children. Of course, when you look at your children and you have a number of children, you realize they're not all the same. They have different personalities. Some might be easier to love than others. They will have different talents. One might have more talents than another child. But your love doesn't depend on any of those things in the life of your children. You will love your child who accomplishes great things as much as you will love the child who may not be able to achieve anything much. There should be no competition for the love of dad and mom within any family. And as human parents, we know that we don't always live up to the ideal that we should. But with our Heavenly Father, beloved, there is never, never any favoritism. The Father loves each one of His children, and He loves them, and He loves us not on the basis of what any of us has done, but He loves us because He's bought us with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Each one of His children, no matter what nationality, no matter what color, no matter what rank, no matter what class you may be, no matter what your abilities might be, no matter whether you're male or whether you're female, every single one of God's children are precious and dear in the sight of God. Beloved, if each one of us is precious in the eyes of our Father, and his brothers and his sisters who must then also treat one another with the same love, with the same respect. Right Within the family of God, there should only be, be love and care for one another. And sometimes that's a challenge. It's a challenge to, to look at one another with the same love and, and care for one another, especially when there are differences or there are things that might get in the way of our relationship. But the reality is, beloved, that we should never need to fear anyone else within the church. Fear them because we think they're better than we are. Fear them because we think they have something over us. Within the church, we should never have envy for our brothers and our sisters who we think might have more than what we have. Within the church, there should never be anybody that we avoid because we despise them. No, we're not to despise our brothers and sisters. We're to love our brothers and our sisters. Even and those who maybe need, those who we might despise normally are people who might need our love even more. Because why? In Christ. In Christ we are free to love one another despite our differences and our, difference and our different abilities. We love one another for we have all received adoption into the very family of God. Here, beloved, in the family of God we are free to serve God and we're serve, free to serve our neighbor, free to serve one another out of love because Christ and because God has first loved us. Amen.